So we've been looking at open system processes. We know that we need to learn where to draw the control volume. We need to figure out what happens to the mass. Then we need to conserve energy. And if we're looking at a process that we don't know is possible, we need to do a second law analysis to see if that open process is generating entropy. Because we know that every process must generate entropy in order to proceed in the universe. These three steps will get us to a symbolic solution for what we're looking for, whether that's trying to find the power generated by a turbine, the heat transferred in a heat exchanger, or whether or not a process is possible in the universe. But always we'll get to this point where we need to be able to fix the states. We'll need to be able to find things like specific enthalpy, specific entropy, and maybe something like the specific volume. And when it comes time to do that, we have to ask ourselves, what's the fluid? So, so these will be our steps, and I'll briefly go over them here. Conservation of mass looks like this. We'll often assume that things are at steady state and there's one inlet and one outlet. Notice that often assuming something is not the same as assuming something every time, right? These are common assumptions, not assumptions we make every time, right? Then we'll go to a first law analysis. Notice here, I'm writing down the first law as if the problem is in imperial units, where I have to divide by GC to get the right quantity for kinetic and potential energy. Here, we'll often assume things like the process is at steady state. It's one inlet, one outlet. The change in kinetic energy can be neglected. The change in potential energy can be neglected. We'll typically assume that processes are simple processes or that they either have heat transfer or power associated with them and we cancel out the other one by saying the process is adiabatic or that it's passive. And then often as we move between different processes, we'll assume that there's no friction losses in whatever pipes or ducts we're using to transport our working fluid and we'll assume that there's no heat losses in the lines. I think there might be one homework question where you don't do these two steps, six and seven, where we don't make these assumptions and you'll see that it's, uh, it's kind of a huge pain because if you include frictional losses, your pressure is always dropping. So when you fix a state, say coming out of a turbine, then going into the condenser, you're going to have to deal with, you're going to have to fix the state again because now you're at a different pressure because you've got friction losses and you're at a different temperature because now you've got heat losses or maybe you're at a different quality if you were under the vapor dome. So we typically neglect uh, friction losses and heat losses in uh, cycle analysis, assuming that these losses are small compared to the big energy terms that we're calculating. If we want to know whether or not a process is possible, we have to do the second law analysis. Here, we typically assume that things are at steady state. We'll sometimes assume that things are one inlet and one outlet and or that things are adiabatic. If we're looking at heat exchangers, my advice has been, you know, it's better to look at the whole heat exchanger because then you're, you get to say that it's adiabatic, right? And if it's adiabatic, then you're left with these, only the mass terms, right? The mass flow rate terms. And that you can get just by fixing the state, right? But ultimately, when we do one of these second law analyses, what we're trying to figure out is, is there any entropy generation? What's the value of sigma dot? And we know that it needs to be positive for the process to take place. So when it comes to fixing states, we always get to this point where we start to ask ourselves, how do I find delta H or delta S? And the question we need to ask in that case is what's the fluid? And there's generally two types of options, right? One is water or something like it. And when I say or something like it, what I mean is something that undergoes a phase change. So when we look at refrigeration cycles, we'll be using refrigerant as the working fluid. But that refrigerant goes through phase changes. It gets condensed and it gets evaporated. So it looks similar to what water would look like in a heat engine. So if, whenever we have these um, what's the fluid questions, it's always a two-part question. And if the first part of the question was water or something like it, 
The second part of the question is, what's the phase? Is it a subcooled liquid? Is it a two-phase mixture? Or is it a superheated vapor? Our other option is that we have an ideal gas. Now, if we have an ideal gas, we also have a two-part question because, okay, it's an ideal gas, but am I going to fix the states assuming that the specific heat is constant? Or am I going to assume that the specific heat is variable? So methods for finding the enthalpy or the change in enthalpy. So we can use tables. So we can use a two-phase table or superheated vapor table in the FE handbook or in the textbook. For subcooled liquids, we assume that they're incompressible. So we can say that the change in the enthalpy is the specific heat, Cp, the specific heat at constant pressure, multiplied by the change in temperature. If we have an ideal pump, remember that ideal pump ends up being isentropic. And if it's an isentropic pump, we can say that the change in enthalpy across that isentropic pump is the specific volume at either state because the specific volumes don't change very much, multiplied by the pressure difference across the pump. If we have an ideal gas, we can also invoke this idea that the change in the enthalpy is the specific heat, Cp, so the specific heat at constant pressure, multiplied by the change in temperature. If we're trying to find the change in specific enthalpy, again, we might be able to use tables, two-phase tables, or superheated vapor tables. For ideal pumps, we know, for ideal pumps and turbines, we know that they're isentropic, which means that the change in entropy is zero. For processes, where the inlet and outlet are subcooled liquids, we can assume that the change in the specific entropy is Cp times the natural log of T2 divided by T1. In some way, this is kind of looks like Cp times delta T, which we can also use if uh, we have, uh, if we're trying to find delta H for a subcooled liquid. And then for ideal gases, we have some choices. So for ideal gases, we, we're always going to have some term that we calculate analytically. But for this change in ideal gas, there's this change in the entropy from temperature and from pressure. So the change in the entropy from temperature we can look up. That's this S superscript zero term that would be on A22 if we were looking for air. And then we can find the specific gas constant. Remember, that's the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass times the natural log of P2 divided by P1. If we assume that specific heats are constant, then we can also get delta S for an ideal gas as a function of the ratio of the temperatures and the ratio of the pressures. Or we can see, do I have the ratio of temperatures and the ratio of specific volumes? Often, we'll use op option B here for open system processes because in open systems, we're more likely to know the pressure ratio than the ratio of specific volumes. But in a closed system, maybe where a piston is moving up and down, we often know the volume ratios, so then we would use option C if we were assuming constant specific heat. But it's always important to remember that options B and C require us to assume that the specific heat is constant. So those options are less accurate than option A. But option A requires that we look things up in a thermodynamic table. So for isentropic processes, there's another thing that we can do, right? So there's some ways that we can find the change in specific enthalpy for ideal gases when the process is isentropic. So this is going to be important when we start to deal with cycles that have air as the working fluid. So things like internal combustion engines or jet engines or natural gas power plants, all of these things use air or at least something we're going to approximate as air as the working fluid. And it's important for us to know how to find the change in enthalpy for the ideal case, say the ideal turbine, when we have an isentropic process. So normally we would say if it was constant specific heat, we'd say that the change in the enthalpy is Cp times delta T. How do we find delta T for ideal gases when the process is isentropic? So if we're trying to find delta H when it's isentropic, we need to know the temperatures. This is true if we're using this constant specific heat equation, Cp times delta T, 
or if we're using table A22, because in table A22, we're going to want to know the temperatures to fix the state. So we have a couple of equations that we can use for ideal gas processes that are isentropic. So it's really, really important that we remember that these equations only work when we're talking about an ideal gas and the process is isentropic. So we would use these for things like an ideal turbine or an ideal compressor when we're increasing the pressure of air. So if I know the pressure ratio, I can find the ratio of the temperatures. Now T2 is the isentropic outlet temperature. So maybe we could call this T2S. And this is going to be related to the ratio of pressures all to the power of K minus 1 divided by K. Now, you might not remember what K is, but K is the specific heat ratio, which is Cp over Cv. This number is always bigger than 1 because Cp is always bigger than Cv. And typically for air, I believe the value is 1.4. T2 over T1, again, if it's an isentropic process, can also be established as a ratio of the volumes. Now, remember how we said in open systems, we'll often know the pressure ratio, sometimes called the compressor pressure ratio, which isn't easy to say 10 times fast. Or if we're talking about closed systems, we'll often know the ratio of volumes, which in, a, in an internal combustion engine, we might call the compression ratio, which is a ratio between volumes of the states our piston goes to between maybe top dead center and bottom dead center. But we can also call this, we can get the ratio of the pressures as a function of the ratio of the volumes as P2 over P1 is equal to V1 over V2 to the power of K. Now remember, all of these state twos are the isentropic outlets. So we could call all of these state twos state two S. So these equations can all be derived by setting de delta S equal to zero. So we've in these equations, right? So all of these equations, really any equation in this class, if you're going to use CP, CV, or K, you have to first tell me that you're assuming that the specific heats are constant because all of these equations assume that the specific heat is constant. So these three equations for isentropic processes all fall out of these two equations here. In this case, the textbook tells you it's because R, the specific gas constant, is Cp minus Cv. So we'll see this more in depth later, again, as we start to look at cycles that have ideal gases as working fluids. But it's important to remember we can use these equations only if we have an ideal gas that's experiencing a process that's isentropic, where delta S is equal to zero. and to apply these particular equations, we have also assumed that specific heat is constant. If specific heat is not constant, we'll figure out that we have to um, use tables to try to find these other states. So now I'll do an example showing you how to do this. So here we have a compressor. A compressor is like a pump, but we use it for an ideal gas. The purpose here is to increase the pressure of this ideal gas. So you see at the inlet, we have this ideal gas coming in at 300 degrees Kelvin and a pressure of 100 kilopascals. Now, out of the compressor, we know that the pressure is 800 kilopascals. So we increase the pressure from one bar to eight bar. Now, the problem asks us, find the power consumed by this compressor divided by the mass flow rate. We're going to assume that the process is steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, that the change in kinetic and potential energies can be neglected, and that this process is isentropic. If I do this, I see from the first law that the power consumed by my compressor is going to be m dot times h in minus h out. Hopefully, this equation is starting to become familiar to you. If the fluid is air, and I assume that specific heats are constant, then I can replace delta H, H in minus H out, with specific heat, Cp, times T in minus T out. So now my equation for power consumed by this compressor is given here. But this isn't what the problem wants. The problem wants power divided by mass flow rate. So this is nice because I don't need to know the mass flow rate. Um, 
I get that the power divided by the mass flow rate is equal to the specific heat times T in minus T out. I don't know the power divided by the mass flow rate. That's what the problem's asking me for. I do know the specific heat for air. I know the temperature in, but I don't know the temperature out. In order to find the temperature out, this is why I'm going to make this isentropic assumption. So here, I don't know enough information to figure out what the idea, what the outlet is, right? Because I only have one, pro um, one property here. I don't have two independent intensive properties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that this is isentropic, and at least I'll find the maximum power that, or the minimum power that this compressor would consume, right? The, the power that the ideal compressor would consume. Right, so now I don't know the power consumed by the, by the compressor, and I don't know the outlet temperature. But if I assume this process is isentropic, I can look at those um, isentropic relationships that I have for ideal gases, if I'm assuming constant specific heat, which I am. So now I can see that T2, or T2S in this case, divided by T1 is equal to P2 divided by P1, all to the power of K minus 1 over K. Or, if I want to isolate for T2, I can multiply both sides by T1. Now, I also know that K is equal to Cp divided by Cv, which is approximately 1.4 for air. If you wanted to look this up, you might want to know exactly what temperature you're at. Uh, but typically for air, this specific heat ratio is 1.4. Now, I know the temperature. I know P2. I know K. And I know P1, right? So I know that ratio of pressures, right? So now I can use this to find T out is equal to T in, P out over P in, K minus 1 over K. I put all this information into my calculator. I remember that here, this is a temperature that doesn't, it's not a delta T. It's just a temperature that stands alone. So I need to put Calvin in here. The problem it told me in Calvin my advice to you is probably going to be anytime you're dealing with ideal gases, work with Kelvin, because you might have to use these, these equations. In these equations, you're going to need to get temperatures in Kelvin. So now here, I'm going to put this information into my calculator. And what I find is that the temperature goes up to 543 Kelvin. So now I know the temperature of the outlet. So now, with the temperature of the outlet, I can find out the power consumed by the pressure. So now, I have Cp, which for air is always approximately 1 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin, multiplied by 300 minus 543 degrees Kelvin. My degrees Kelvin cancel out, and what I get is that the compressor power, or the specific compressor power, because we're taking this and we're dividing it by the mass flow rate, is minus 243 kilojoules Per kilogram. Now again, I don't know that this is correct, right? And I guess it's it's not actually correct because what I'm doing is I'm assuming this is the ideal compressor power, but otherwise I can't answer the question, right? So this at least tells me the best case scenario, right? But I know that the units are right, and I know that the sign here is correct. I'm always gonna, you know, pumps and compressors are the same. They're consuming power. So here, H in minus H out should be negative, and that's what I get here. So I feel pretty good about this answer. So I got the sign right. I got the units right. I feel reasonably confident with my answer, provided that everyone understands that this is the ideal compressor. In real life, we're going to be consuming more power than this. So now that we've gone through open systems, we're going to start to look at chaining these open systems together. And the good news is, We've already sort of slipped in a Rankine cycle analysis, but today we're going to introduce this idea of vapor power systems or Rankine cycle. So a Rankine cycle is just a chain of open system processes. Now we've seen this diagram before, right? So in a Rankine cycle, this is, you know, I've said before that, you know, when we give mechanical engineers heat, a lot of times what we want to do is boil water. And the reason we want to do that is because we can generate steam, and we know that if we have steam, it'll expand through a turbine, spin those fan blades in the turbine, and create this spinning shaft, which we can use as mechanical work. So 
kind of the workhorse or the, the reason that we run these Rankine cycles is that we want to run the turbine, right? We want to get high pressure, high enthalpy steam that's coming into my turbine, and then I'm going to reduce the enthalpy of that steam in order to get this spinning shaft in my turbine. Now, the whole rest of the process, and I've said this before, is really just to get back to that high pressure, high enthalpy steam. What we want to do is now we've lowered the pressure as we've gone through the turbine. What we ultimately want to do is get back to that pressure. But in order to do that, it's hard to compress um, a vapor. It takes a lot more power than to compress a liquid. So what we do is we take this steam and we cool it down until it's a liquid. And then we can do this uh, low power pump to increase the pressure back to where we were. But now we have this high pressure fluid, but the temperature is not especially high and it's liquid. And I want to run steam through my turbine. So what do I do? I add heat, either from something like a nuclear reaction or like burning fossil fuels like coal. And when I do that, I add that heat so that I can take this liquid water that's at high pressure and boil it and get steam or water vapor. And then I can go through my turbine again, right? And now what's going to happen is we're just going to go around and around and around and run this in a cycle, right? Remember Calvin and Planck said, if we're running in a cycle, we have to have heat in right, to produce power, but we also have to have a heat sink. So we can't turn all of this heat into power, we have to be able to reject some heat to the environment as well. So why do you care, right? Why do we care about Rankine cycles, right? And the answer is because um, we all like electricity, right? Having lights is pretty good for life as humans, right? You, especially now that we're doing this virtually, you're watching this on a computer. That computer is powered by energy and still a lot of our energy in the United States comes from coal, right? Maybe you want to watch your TV after, right? Maybe catch something on Netflix, right? Or maybe you want to power your cell phone. All of these things require energy, right? They require power. Now that power typically gets generated mechanically and then turned into electrical energy because we made friends with some electrical engineers who said, oh, you've got a spinning shaft. I can turn that into power so this is the table that the textbook presents, and I think it's a little bit out of date now, but it shows coal power plants as the number one power plant type in the United States. I think that the sum of coal and natural gas power plants is still pretty close. Uh, I looked on the internet this morning, and I think it said the total now between coal and natural gas is something in the mid 60s. But now natural gas is higher on this list than coal is. Right? But we also have some nuclear power generation and we have some hydroelectric, other renewables. So these numbers are a little bit out of date, but still most of our energy in the United States comes from burning fossil fuels. Although we've seen this kind of um, emergence of natural gas power plants because the United States has a lot of natural gas. Um, we're working on getting better ways of getting it out of the ground right now, but, um, but we're still dependent on fossil fuels for energy. So when we look at power plant types, right? So there's coal fuel. So coal fired power plants are Rankine cycles, right? So we burn coal to boil water. Nuclear power plants are also Rankine cycles. So we run this nuclear reaction, right? Sort of in some ways, the pinnacle of human science, right? We learned how to split the atom and we do it because it generates a lot of heat and we use that heat to boil water. And then in the textbook, again, there's some of these renewable energy types, so things like biomass, geothermal, uh, solar concentrating cycles can also be used to run Rankine cycles. So as I've said before, we as mechanical engineers, we know that if we have heat, one of the things we can do with it is boil water or maybe some other kind of working fluid, and we can use that to generate steam and run a turbine. So in this textbook, uh, the textbook again said about 70% of energy in the U.S. is produced using Rankine cycles. Uh, I think that number is lower now, again, because uh, the amount of coal power plants that we're using is increasing or is decreasing while natural gas power plant usage is increasing. So how does a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant work? Right. So at this, this is, a, again, it's a picture from the textbook. Uh, 
right? So it says that we can divide these coal power plants into four kind of major subsystems, right? Water is the working fluid in many Rankine cycles, but it doesn't have to be water. You can do this also with things like refrigerants or some other type of fluid that's boiling and condensing. So the main thing here, right, is it's a heat engine, right? So you have to add heat somehow, right? So in a, a coal-fired power plant, we add heat by burning coal. And then in the center, this is kind of like the part that we're talking about in this class, is that, okay, we're getting heat from some source. What's going on with the working fluid, right? So we use this heat to boil water that's at high pressure. That goes through a turbine, right? That turbine is spinning some shaft. And then we get this uh, steam that's at low pressure here that we condense. We run back through a pump so we can get to high pressure. We boil again, and we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it because we're continuously generating power. Again, we need to have friends, we need to make friends with uh, electrical engineers because we want to turn that spinning shaft into some kind of power that we can put on the grid. And then the other thing we need to do is, right, Calvin and Planck told us that we need to have some heat sink, right? So oftentimes this is in some kind of a cooling tower, which we've talked about. This you might see on something like the Simpsons, right? So you have this um, water that's running through here that's taking heat out of our working fluid. So this working fluid that we have here is water, but maybe here in the cooling tower, we're using this, we're increasing the temperature of the water. Maybe we're even making steam. We put it in the cooling tower, the water vapor comes up and it keeps raining down, right? So we're, we're sort of running this loop. So what makes something a Rankine cycle is not how you add the heat and it's not how you remove the heat and it's not how you're turning the mechanical work into the electrical work. What makes the Rankine cycle is this part. And in its most basic form, it's these four components chained together. A turbine, a condenser, a pump, and a boiler. Right, so this is if I'm a little water molecule, right, or a little bit, a fluid element of water, I'm just running through this system, I'm boiling, I'm condensing, I'm going through these turbines, I'm making power. So we've also been talking about how thermodynamics is really looking at the universe as a series of these energy transactions. So in a coal power plant, what we have is we have chemical energy that's stored in these fossil fuels, right? And we'd like to get that energy out, right? So we want to use that energy, we burn it, and that generates heat energy. That heat energy we put into, we, we turn that into enthalpy, an increase in enthalpy of water that's going through our boiler. And when we turn that into mechanical energy, as that steam expands across these turbine blades, then we get this spinning shaft. And then we turn that into electrical energy because this spinning shaft is running an electrical generator. So in fossil fuel power plants, we're adding heat, right? These are all heat engines. So in these fossil fuel power plants, we're getting that heat by burning something and that something is coal or maybe natural gas is now kind of the dominant mode here in the united states but you can get heat from anywhere to run these kinds of systems right so we can run we can get that heat from a nuclear power plant that's what this is showing right so this is kind of the textbook schematic of what a nuclear power plant looks like and we have this sort of hot fluid that's running through here and what it does is it boils the water that's in our Rankine cycle. We can have something like a solar collecting power plant where we have the sun, right? That's where, you know, all of our energy here on Earth comes from, right? And then we have these uh, reflectors that are reflecting heat up into some channels that are running through here. Maybe there's some kind of working fluid here. It says molten salt or oil that's going through here. And again, that heat is used so we're heating something up and we're using that heat to boil water. And as we boil water, or maybe it's a refrigerant or something. And when we do that, we boil it so that it can expand over these turbine blades and spin a shaft. You can do this geothermally. Now you're getting heat from the fact that, you know, down in the core of the earth, sometimes you get things that are generating heat, right? So you can use that heat to boil water, right? You give a mechanical engineer heat, and a lot of times the thing we want to do is boil water or something like it. So the neat thing about this is that 
as mechanical engineers in this class, the way we analyze a Rankine cycle is independent of how we get the heat, and it's independent of how we cool the water, and it's independent of how we run this electrical generator. What it's about is analyzing these open system processes. In this case, there are four, and that's the most basic case, but we'll learn that by uh, increasing the complexity, we can drive up thermal efficiency. So for all of these different Rankine cycles, we can get heat from different places. But it doesn't really matter to us because all that is outside of our control system, right? So if we, if we draw our control volume here or our system, the system we're interested in on the macro scale is what's inside here. What are these open systems? What are these different components that we're using? And that's independent of where we get the heat. We can define a thermal efficiency because this is a heat engine. And the thermal efficiency for a Rankine cycle, the purpose of running a Rankine cycle or the benefit is going to be net power generated. So the power generated by the turbine, but the first consumer of the power plant is the power plant. So we also have to run this pump. So we'll add those two numbers together, realizing that the power from the pump is negative. That'll give us our energy benefit. The cost is that we have to burn coal or we have to run some kind of nuclear reaction, right? and that heat in, that's our cost. So this is telling us how much of this input heat did we actually turn into usable mechanical power. So like I said, the simplest Rankine cycle has to have at least these four components. A turbine, where we're generating power, a condenser, where we turn the steam that comes out of the turbine back into liquid water, a pump that we use to increase the pressure of that liquid water, and then a boiler that we use to turn that high pressure liquid into a high pressure vapor that we can expand through our turbine. So we're interested in how do we do a first law analysis on a, bo on a boiler? How do we do it on a turbine? How do we analyze a condenser? And how do we analyze a pump? The sneaky thing is that I've already showed you how to do all this and even how to chain all these things together. But let's draw all these things together on a TS diagram. Right? So in the TS diagram, what's the purpose of the boiler? It takes us from maybe from saturated liquid water out to saturated water vapor. The turbine then takes us from that saturated water vapor that's at a high pressure down to some lower enthalpy state. Right? And if it's an ideal or isentropic turbine, this is a vertical line down on my TS diagram. The condenser condenses the fluid. right? So it's taking this output from the turbine, which might be over here and be totally superheated vapor, or maybe it's a little bit under the vapor dome. So it's some mixture of saturated vapor and saturated liquid, and we're trying to get more liquid. Ideally, we want all liquid coming out here because we don't want to put vapor into our pump, right? Our pump, we're adding power, and we add this power to increase the pressure. And then we get back to our boiler again, and we just keep running this system over and over and over again. Right now, we did that all under the vapor dome the first time I showed you this because I wanted the heat addition and heat rejection to all happen at the same temperature to kind of prove a point mathematically. But in a real system, we want our turbine, we would prefer not to have any water in our turbine because any kind of water droplets in there with those turbine blades as they're spinning around, they're going to impact those blades. And those blades are at least somewhat delicate and we'd like to preserve the life of our turbine. So we'd like to have vapor come into our turbine and vapor come out of our turbine. Our condenser, we want to condense this fluid until it's all the way saturated liquid. And then our pump's going to give us saturated liquid on the way out. And then our boiler, we add heat to get back up here. So when I draw these on TS diagrams, I also like to draw sort of the dominant energy term that I'm interested in, right? The purpose of the turbine is to get power out of the cycle, right? So here I'm drawing this power line, this straight line out of the cycle. The condenser, it's rejecting heat. So now I have this squiggly line, which I use to tell myself that it's heat transfer, and it's coming out of the cycle. The pump is putting power into the cycle. So now again, I have this straight arrow that's going into the cycle. No, it's coming in, right? So work in, that's negative, right? And now I have this heat transfer term in the boiler, that's coming in to the system, right? So heat in is positive. So this is positive heat 
This is negative heat. This is positive power. This is negative power. So this is how I like to draw my TS diagrams. Remember, if you're dealing with a Rankine cycle, you have to have a vapor dome, right? The whole thing about a Rankine cycle is it's this vapor power cycle. So you need to have this transition between vapor and liquid. That's what a Rankine cycle is. So if you're drawing a Rankine cycle, you're also drawing a vapor dome. So now we know that the thermal efficiency is going to be the energy benefit, that's net power, divided by the energy cost, which is only the heat in. It's not the net heat. If it was net heat, efficiency would be 100% every time, no matter what we did, and it would not be a very useful parameter to look at. So I know when I look at this, my turbine power is positive, my pump power is negative, right? So it's a green arrow for positive, a red arrow for negative. So what the textbook tells you, although maybe the clarity is not exactly there, the textbook tells you that the net power is the turbine power minus the pump power. But they're taking the absolute value of both of these terms. What I'm going to tell you is always use the first law for these terms. So calculate the turbine power, it's naturally going to be positive from the first law. It's H in minus H out. Calculate the pump power, it's also going to be H in minus H out, and you're going to get that turbine power plus pump power gives you net work because the net or the pump power will be negative. It's the way the textbook does it, having to be absolute value signs, um, gets confusing, particularly when we start to look at um, different cycles because sometimes you add pump power, sometimes you subtract pump power. Um, when you're, when you're finding power, sometimes it's H in minus H out, sometimes it's H out minus H in, and the equations that they get can't be derived from the first law. So I'm going to tell you, always use the first law, add things up, and let the first law help you with the signs. Heat transfer in happens in the boiler. It's going to be a positive term, right? So here, this is heat in. So even though this is a, uh, the textbook treats this as an absolute value, it's positive anyway. So if I talk about my thermal efficiency for a Rankine cycle, it's the magnitude of the turbine power minus the magnitude of the pump power divided by the magnitude of the heat in at the boiler. This is how the textbook tells you, but it doesn't put the absolute value signs in there. Right? The way that I'm probably going to encourage you to do this, the way that I do this myself, is that I say that, the, that it's turbine power, which is positive, plus pump power, which is negative, divided by heat transfer in. So I also think, I don't, nobody ever takes me up on this, but I think it's a good idea to use colored pencils when you're writing the exam, because if you do that, you'll be able to tell which values are supposed to be positive, which values are supposed to be negative. Now, like I said, nobody's ever taken me up on it, but I think it's a nice way to kind of organize how we're thinking. Right, so what we would do when we're analyzing these Rankine cycles is we would do the first law for every component. So the common assumptions here are going to be that things are at steady state, that there's one inlet and one outlet, that there's no kinetic energy change and no potential energy change. Now, those assumptions we're going to use on most of the components. But then we're going to look at different components and say, well, is the main thing the power or is the main thing the heat transfer? And oftentimes, unless we're given other information, we'll assume that the that the system is either, that each individual process is either adiabatic, right, which is an assumption we would often make for a turbine or a pump, or it's passive, which is an assumption we would make at the boiler or on the condenser. We'll also typically assume that there are no friction losses or heat losses in the lines between these different components, so that the outlet state of the turbine is the same as the inlet state in the condenser that it didn't lose pressure or temperature as it was traveling between those two components. For each component that's adiabatic, what we see is that the power is m dot in, m dot times h in minus h out, right? This is like the dwarves, hi ho, right? So, right, so this is, it's, again, it's kind of a silly way to remember, but I find it's helpful to know what the answer is supposed to look like. Again, this is just kind of what it's supposed to look like if you've made specific assumptions. You might get a problem on a test where 
I make you demonstrate your understanding of the problem by forcing you to relax some of those assumptions. What if there's heat loss in the system? Then your, your power here is going to look different, right? So you need to know how to derive these equations. If it's passive, where the power is equal to zero, usually we'll get something that looks like Q dot is equal to M dot times H out minus H in, right? So it's kind of the opposite because in the first law, it's Q minus W. So these things have different signs, right? The sign convention is different for heat transfer and for power. So what happens is here, I, I try to sort of lump these things together by color, right? So the turbine is adiabatic and the pump is adiabatic. We get the same result in the first law if we can make all those common assumptions that it's M dot times H in minus H out, right? But the turbine power, I expect to be positive. Right, for the pump, it's also m dot times h in minus h out, but we expect the pump power to be negative. The condenser, which is passive, we expect to be m dot times h out minus h in, but here we're rejecting heat. Heat out is negative. And in the boiler where we're adding heat, it's still m dot times h out minus h in, but we expect heat added to be positive. So these are the equations that we expect to get if we can make all of these assumptions. Now, I might, you know, give you the opportunity to demonstrate that you understand how to get these equations on a test by making you relax some of those assumptions so you could derive what a turbine with heat losses might look like. And then what happens is after we do this, now we have symbolic solutions. We've got a symbolic solution for each one of these components. We have a symbolic solution for um, for the thermal efficiency. And now what we're left with is this question that we always ask when we're doing these types of things is what's the fluid? How am I supposed to find the specific enthalpies or the change in the specific enthalpies? And then I got to ask, in this case, when we're talking about Rankine cycles, the fluid will always be water or something that looks like water. You need to have a vapor dome and you've got to be moving back and forth across it if you're doing a Rankine cycle. So here, we will find these H's in the ways that we would find H's for water, right? So turbine, maybe you're looking this up on superheated vapor tables. A condenser, maybe you're looking this up on two-phase tables. A pump, you're going to have to use um, maybe an isentropic pump, a pump equation, right? So that uh, specific volume times the change in pressure will give you delta H. But that's for the ideal or the isentropic pump. So then maybe you'd have to use something like an isentropic efficiency to find the outlet of the real pump. The boiler, here you're going to be coming in at some subcooled liquid probably. So H4 is probably some subcooled liquid enthalpy. So you probably have to remember that H of a subcooled liquid is approximately HF of a subcooled liquid with the same temperature. And then you're going to be coming out maybe as a saturated vapor or a superheated vapor. So you're going to have to be able to find H1 as well. So thermal efficiency generally is going to be the net power divided by the heat in. And if I only have a, one turbine and one pump, then the net power is just summing these two things up, right? So now my rank and cycle thermal efficiency is going to look like this, right? Because I can put in the equations from each individual component. Now the textbook, you get to this same answer, right? The textbook will tell you that it's turbine power minus pump power, but they define pump power as H out minus H in to get a um, positive value. So they end up with the same equation that we get here, right? So that's okay. And then the cool thing is if all my components are one inlet and one outlet, we've talked about this before, but that means if we're at steady state and we have all one inlet and all one outlet that are chained together in series, then what happens is there's only one mass flow rate. So I could factor the mass flow rate out of the numerator and the denominator and drop all the mass flow rates out. So my thermal efficiency, many times, I'll only need to know the enthalpies, right? So I can think of thermal efficiency as the net power divided by the net heat in, but it's also the net specific power divided by the specific heat in, right? So those are the same things just divided by the mass flow rates. So let's say I had a Rankine cycle there was a four component Rankine cycle and these were my four states. So state one is the inlet to my turbine, 
State two is the outlet of my turbine, which is also the inlet to my condenser. State three is the outlet of my condenser, which is the inlet of my pump. And state four is the outlet of my pump, which is the inlet of my boiler. Now the boiler process runs from state four up to state one. So we go from this low enthalpy, but high pressure liquid up to this high enthalpy, high pressure steam. So if I wanted to find the thermal efficiency, I get H1 minus H2 minus H4 minus H3 divided by H1 minus H4, right? So I can do this, I can find this, I put all this stuff into my calculator. I get that the thermal efficiency here is 55.3% or 0.553. So why is the efficiency so low? Right, so first, I mean, is it low? So we'd have to compare kind of this to the Carnot efficiency to see how low it is, right? Because remember, we're not, 100% efficiency is not the maximum efficiency that we can get, right? But if we're talking about coal power plants, um, we lose energy when we make this energy transaction, when we go from burning fuel to adding heat, we lose energy because we have to get this, these phase transfers, right? This phase transformation, it takes a lot of energy. We, our heat sink here, right? Remember, you know this idea that um, a watch pot never boils, right? It takes a lot of energy to boil water. You also have to remove a lot of energy to condense water. So here, our heat sink, like we, we lose a lot of heat when we do this, right? So there's a, there's a couple of things that drive this efficiency, why, why the efficiency isn't higher and we're constantly trying to make the efficiency better, right? Because everyone wants to be able to ideally produce more power by burning less fossil fuel, right? So there's there's financial incentive to do this. There's like an ethical responsibility to do this. So, I mean, everyone wants to have better efficiency in these kinds of plants, right? So we're always moving forward trying to do that. Now, another way that we can sort of characterize these particular cycles is with what we call the backwork ratio. So the thermal efficiency, remember that's saying how much of the input heat do we transform into usable mechanical energy, right? So the backwork ratio is a little bit different. The backwork ratio is trying to remind us that the first consumer of the power plant is the power plant. So the backwork ratio tells us how much of the turbine power is needed to run the pump, right? I guess in an, in a, well, it's tricky. I was gonna say in an ideal world, but we know in thermodynamics, the word ideal means something, right? But it would be amazing if we could do this without even having to have a pump, right? We could have a turbine and the turbine's you know, generating power and we didn't even have to plug the pump in for it to work. Right? But that's not possible in real life. So one way that we can look at this is we can find the backwork ratio. So the backwork ratio basically says what percentage of the turbine power is used to run the pump. And this is why, this is one of the arguments for using Rankine cycles. Right? So if everything here is one inlet and one outlet, we can get this equation if we take the absolute values here because we want a backwork ratio to be positive. So here we can look at the change in enthalpy across the pump and the change in enthalpy across the turbine, provided that everything is steady state and one inlet, one outlet, because then the mass flow rates are the same. And if we look at the backward ratio here, so we can find this out for our problem, the cool thing is that the, uh, the turbine is producing 1,788.9 kilojoules per kilogram, right? That's its specific power generation. And the specific power consumed by the pump is 7.6 kilojoules per kilogram, right? So the backwork ratio here is very low, right? So remember when I said one of the reasons that we, that we run these systems is because we don't have to worry about compressing that steam to get into the turbine. What we do is we cool the steam down and then it's, it's relatively easy. It takes much less power to increase the pressure of the liquid, right? And that gives us a very low backwork ratio. So most of the power that we produce in a, in a coal power plant or in a nuclear power plant ends up going out on the grid. Now the cost for that, right, is that we have to change that steam that comes out of the turbine into liquid water. And that 
involves having a very large heat sink, right? It, it, we have to take out a lot of heat for that to happen, which reduces our thermal efficiency. So it's nice to have a low backwork ratio, but thermal efficiency is pretty important too. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Virtual Thermodynamics. I'll see you again next time.